All right. Well, thank you, everybody, for coming. Um, I'm Jennifer Carroll. I'm a member of the Wellness Committee, uh, PRI Wellness Committee, and this is one of our first organized wellness events. So thank you all for coming. Um, I'd like to remind you about some upcoming wellness events that we have planned. Um, on Tuesdays at the water survey, we have a yoga class. Um, although that's full right now, we're hoping to have future sessions. So keep your eyes open for emails about that. Um, on Wednesday, May 10th, in the ISTC conference room, we're bringing in a presenter from the uh, U of I Wellness, Wellness Center who's going to give a presentation called uh, staying fit in an active world and their presentations are always very um, informative and well done so you should go to that one too uh, we have some additional resources online we've put together some walking maps for all of the survey buildings and um, you can find those on the PRI staff intranet so today we're welcoming Steve Wald and Lily Wilcock and uh, some of you may know Steve from when he worked here for the Prairie Research Institute in the executive director's office. But now he's the communications director for U of I Extension. And he's also a board member of Champaign County Bikes. And um, Lily is the, act the campus active transportation coordinator. And in preparation for National Bike Month next month, they're going to be showing us how we can become practical bike commuters and um, give us some tips and tricks for even going beyond bike commuting. So, thank you. Hey, everybody. Thanks so much, Jennifer. Um, it's great to be back in NRB. Um, I am really, really close, and it's shocking how little often my pathway brings me here anymore, which is, which is crazy. I, I probably worked in this building for eight years, and I uh, love the surveys. I'm just extremely busy with extension. Um, and uh, But I do not have my extension hat on right now. I'm here as just a normal person and a board member of 50 County Bikes. And in fact, I think I'm the designated, like, just completely average normal person on the board. I represent people <laughs> who don't wear spandex, who have not, <laughs> who have not like, booked plane tickets across the country, 400-mile rides and things like that. I'm just a normal guy. I uh, Rode my bike as a kid, rode my bike very casually through my adult life, and when I moved to Champaign Urbana in 2006, um, started riding my bike uh, a little more often. We lived pretty close to campus, just became a very casual bike commuter, and have, have biked more and more. And it's become a real sort of central aspect of my quality of life here. And so, a part of what I want to talk about around bike commuting and exploring sort of beyond the towns on, on the bicycle is just to share some of like my sense of discovery um, so my sort of growth path along those ways and that you do not have to be an elite athlete to do it and you do not have to be you know like fully bearded and fully burly and wearing thousands of dollars of gear to do it um very very casual very normal people can do it do it well and enjoy it that's really part of part of my message let me introduce willie uh, lily wilcock too um so lily is the campus Active Lily, transportation right. coordinator. Yeah. Uh, I work within facilities and services and transportation demand management. And so there's uh, policy, infrastructure, programming, a lot of that uh, falls into our campus facilities and services. And we try to do our best to make this as a bikeable campus as possible. And we do a lot of programming for that and do a lot of advocacy work for that too, as well. And uh, transportation demand management is a small group, but we're also involved with the the campus bike center, which is right here in the garages behind this building. And so I'm here yeah. almost every day, yeah. <laughs> but never in here, right. or rarely, unless Margaret Chambers says there's a package. Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so it's it's awesome to talk to you guys. Uh, I completely agree. Bike commuting, if there were any serious barriers to entry, for me, I would have never gotten going as soon as I did get going. Uh, eventually, in various parts of my life, in different, I've gone down the many rabbit holes for, for cycling. Um, and I've worn spandex, and I've worn the rain cape, and I've worn the, the, the fun different styles of biking. It's a very, very, very varied group of people that are out there biking. There's all sorts of different roles to play with it. 
But commuting is one of the most practical ones, and it's also one of the most rewarding as far as getting to work and being a part of the community. So, super great. Um, I, re I know many of you, and I recognize some uh, regular commuters in the audience, but just so we know, like, who currently considers himself a regular bike commuter? Okay. And how about like part time, like you do it sometimes, like either part of the year or a couple days a week. And is anyone here like not have a bike? Okay. Or like not been on a bike for a year? Okay. Okay. So I'm testing a couple edges there. Um, that's terrific. That's helpful just to sort of know who's in the audience and, and, uh, and where folks are with their biking. Um, this is going to be real informal from my end. I would say interruptions are welcome if you guys have a question. Um, I guess I'm going to start by saying this is timely to time of year to talk about biking because the seasons are changing. People are getting out of uh, out of the house, eager to get out of the house. This in bike month uh, is May, so it's right around the corner. And um, if you're interested in sampling a wide variety of bike related activities and opportunities, this is the time of year to do it. And you even have like, you know, two or three weeks here to get your act together and be ready to go on bike month. So I wanted to start just by opening with that and saying it's, it's really um, a, a well-run thing and the entire local bike community, community comes together to, to put this on. I have handouts of this schedule. Um, it's available online, but almost every day in the, like, in the month of May, something's going on somewhere with biking. Some of it's athletic. Some of it is primarily alcoholic. Some of it is like very social. Um, it promotes uh, biking to work, biking to school, all ages of biking. Lots of, <coughs> lots of different things going on um, in the month of May. So I wanted to just flag that at the top and of the- Just to add really yeah. quickly, uh, April is Earth Week, is Paul's within uh, April. And so that's the reason why I gave everybody a quarter sheet of the rides they're having on campus. There is so much going on this time of year on campus as far as bike biking is concerned. So if you really want to get involved with the even, uh, even closer community, this is, uh, you know, next week we're going to have a Chancellor bike ride. The Chancellor oh. will be at the Campus Bike Center right behind this building. Oh my gosh. Bike ride with Marisol. So That's good. there's going to be a lot of really fun stuff. And then I think right after that, you get your bike prepared on the quad by Marisol. There's a lot of stuff going on. I couldn't fit everything on that quarter sheet, but if you want to know more and everything, feel free to get in touch with some of the social media uh, things on the back of that version too as well, and more about what's happening on campus. Great. Thanks. And, um, you know, when I, I really sort of first slide or organizing thing, you think about the benefits of bike commuting. Um, and I mean, I've got to lead with convenience. I mean, for me, it's really funny. I, ride, I come into work and like, oh my gosh, you rode your bike today. Like when people see a bike commuter, they think, this is like virtue, this is self-denial, self <laughs> this is like some hugely hard and meritorious thing you're doing. And it's, it feels good, believe me, I'm ready to take credit for all of that. But the bottom line is, it is just <coughs> very, very convenient. Some of that is based on, I do live pretty close to campus, so I can get to work in less than five minutes on my bike. However, having a bike on campus and being, uh, just unlocks like a very convenient lifestyle, even while you're at work. And I have some friends who actually keep a bike at work. They live too far away to bike commute, but they have access to a bike here on campus because it's so darn convenient. I know some folks on campus who will park at E14 for a very affordable parking permit, right? And then they'll have a bike in their car so they can bike on campus and have a bike all day around and then hop back over to E14 at the end of the day. And that way they're not relying on on a shovel service, and they also feel like they can get around campus so fast and easy. Yeah. So, so Steve, since yeah. this is informal, I would just like to add to your list. Yeah. Because I like I like every day all year round except when there's ice, basically. Yeah. And, yeah, that's me too. And just to to expose everything, there are days when I just want to scream by the end of the day. You know, you know, just for mental health reasons. Yeah. 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 On the way home, it's just this can be this. Decompression and and you know air everything out, leave it behind, and yep, and that's actually pretty significant. Yeah, I completely concur. And uh, and another efficiency there is, and you said you mentioned it earlier. It's about a twenty minute ride for you each way. You're getting in your recommended daily exercise by default. It's completely efficient. Um, 
Sit, but that uh, I agree on the way in, getting your blood flowing before work and on the way home, letting some of it out on the way home from work. Um, having a commute like that is is uh, has has benefits. Um, on the convenience factor, again, I, I can't say enough about this. So I found a cool tool online, a mapping thing. And it basically said, lets you plug in an address and decide whether you're a car or a pedestrian or a biker and how fast you're moving. Where can you go? How far can you get in a certain amount of time? So this is, represents five minutes moderate biking pace from this building. And that's a perimeter. Uh, the algorithm actually uses bike-friendly streets as it sort of seeks out the perimeter and then it sort of draws a polygon around it. Um, and I got to say, in this five-minute loop, you know, you can almost get out to the research park. You can certainly get up to Green Street anywhere on campus. You can make any meeting. Think about what your life would be like if uh, you know you could get up from your desk and be wherever the heck you're trying to get in central campus and beyond in five minutes. Meeting a friend for lunch. Most people walk to their parking spot. It takes longer than that, let alone trying to find parking. And we all know how hellacious it is to park or repark anywhere on campus. That never happens on your bicycle. You can stroll up to where you're going and park usually like within 50 feet of the front door of the building you're going. So you always have good parking. That's another convenience factor here. This is a, a 10 minute perimeter from this building. Okay, so the close in residential neighborhoods, uh, both downtowns um, within 10 minutes of this building. How many people's commute in their car, for, including their parking into to their desk is less than 10 minutes. Um, and so if you back it all the way out to 20 minutes, you now have outer neighborhoods, Barringer, Stone Creek, large parts of Southeast Champaign, all the way to Parkland, Marketplace Mall, and almost to the airport are all within a 20 minute ride from this building. That kind of blows people away. But here's the thing, I, impromptu people are like, oh, let's meet for a drink after work, blah, 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 blah. I'm always there first. They're always driving. <laughs> I show up on my bike. It's crazy and they can't believe it. And it's not like, you know, any big deal. That I am not so a super true. athlete. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. Because, you know, I'm not walking five blocks to my the parking garage and then trying to find parking and then walking from the parking in. A lot of a lot of it gets there in the stoplights and everything. So uh, I think this comes as a surprise to many people. I think it's one of the hidden barriers. It just sounds like, you know, from behind, you're at the comfort behind the wheel, looking out at the world and you're safe, like weatherproof dome. Anything else seems impossible. It just seems like too much of a barrier. But um, as a daily commuter, and Steve, you can attest to this, I mean, how many days in the course of the year is it? drenching rain on the way into work. These, Not are, very many. these are like a handful. It might be sprinkling, but an actual like barrier level event is very rare. No, I can't think Yeah. That. Even though we have plenty of rainy days in Champagne, the idea of everything aligns that it nukes you is actually very low. <laughs> Did you have a thought on that? Yeah, if you just wait, there's usually a window yeah. like, where you can go between and get here at eight o'clock-ish. Or same for leaving, you get home, you can leave five o'clock-ish yeah. through some window to yeah. watch the radar. With your eye on the radar, exactly. So um, again, somebody who sort of does it every day and not because I'm built of some, you know, super, it's just not that hard. The weather is not the very thing. And be. there's plenty of communities in this country that have, hands down, have way worse weather than we do. You know, you go to Minnesota, you go to Seattle, you go to Oregon, you go to either rainy or blizzard condition places, and the bike commuting numbers are not as high as we're being in Illinois, but they're a lot higher net than the national uh, average for bike commuting. And that's really, that's extraordinary because you we would think, oh, well, it's just, it's too hard. It's actually, once you get going and you have the right gear, like, it's so easy. Yeah. Um, and so, again, on the convenience front, um, you know, as you buy employees, you have free access to MTD. MTD <coughs> has bike rack. So if something happens and you know what, boom, I need another option home, you can jump on MTD to get home, including with your bike. Um, and in terms of cost, um, I know the wear and tear on our vehicles is almost nothing because my whole family bikes a lot now and we have pretty low mileage. Um, I don't pay for parking on campus. On those terrible days that I do drive, I pay for hourly parking at a meter. You know, I've got the app on my phone. It's not too inconvenient at all. My parking spot, when I do that, is closer than everyone who has monthly parking. Um, so not everyone in the world can do that. Lily's probably wincing inside by me saying this, but I have found a successful strategy is to bike 80 to 90% of the time and to park 
I would force it. So when I, when I don't have another choice. No, I'm, I only bike 100% of the time because I'm stubborn. Yeah. No, for yeah. sure. Yeah. yeah. That's awesome. Um, and you know, these more ephemeral, poetic, this is my mental, these are my mental health categories, Steve. So the one is immersion. So, and that is just, when you're out on your bike, there's something about not having like a shell around you. You see so many details and you just notice stuff. I mean, I notice people's gardens coming in. I notice the changing of the seasons. I see the conditions of the streets. And if I am, Bumping into people, I have a very easy option to like stop and talk to them. I feel more embedded in my community when I'm biking through it than when I'm driving through it because it's more of a human scale and uh, there's time to see stuff. And this is true in town and the stuff you see is like related to like local public policy, architecture, you know, all kinds of cultural things. And when I'm out on the prairie, like the exposure to nature is also then this like a revelation to me to be biking out of, out of town too. So the immersion thing is really big. The awareness of scale, and uh, that includes like horizontal scale because you're pedaling it, and vertical scale because even though it's flat here, you feel every change in vertical relief. And it's imperceptible to most people. We're in the flattest you know, part of the United States, but on a bicycle, the gravity is, you can feel it. And so you get, you, I feel like I have a better sense of, of our topography such as it is. And uh, the last thing, my wife really articulated this one. When we started biking more for routine things, biking to the library, biking to farmer's market, the, it takes a part of your life, which is usually throwaway time, getting in the car, getting out of your car, and makes it like part of your experience. So the journey of getting somewhere is not just waiting for that to happen and to get where you're going. The journey is part of the quality too. And this is, I think, a really key part of why biking has improved my quality of life and my enjoyment of living it, living here. Because you can bike so much of it, very practical, and yeah, makes it fun. Um, I have a picture, a couple pictures here about some of the stuff you see. This is these are out of town pictures, but um, they're an example of of what you can see, right? So we're biking by. We're probably going 14 miles an hour on gravel in the middle of Vermilion County like miles from pavement. Holy cow, you see the size of that thing? You don't stop, you get up and look at it. And uh, you get to some really crazy out of the way places here um, uh, when, when you go explore off roads as well. Okay, so we already talked about weather um, and the idea of, you know, a lot of people say, hey, I can't be on my bike because I gotta pick up my kid afterwards, or I've gotta do X, I gotta do Y, I gotta do Z. We've solved most of those in our family, I just say they, can be solvable or sometimes they're not and that's fine. Um, but I wanted to talk about like traffic and on-road techniques and I'll, I'll turn to you. I have some I have some things you could talk to if you want. Lily, I'm kind of sabotaging her. But since Lily does this for a living, I'm comfortable. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I think one of the biggest barriers a lot of people have are that it's, we have a core group of people in champaign Urbana. we have about 10% mode shares. So the people out of all of the trips that we're making, about 10% of them are on bike. It's really good. It's really, really good. You'd be like, wow, 10%, that's so low. No, that's pretty darn good. What's the national average? Because like, you were saying, oh, it's like 1.3% yeah, or really something low. like that. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah, the suburbs, people drive. Whoa. Yeah, it's so not we're, good. We're distorted up by all the students. So there's like large numbers of people who have alternative lifestyles, yeah. typical American. How about in our, in our flatness? Our Flatness, compactness close. and those numbers and that centrality, all that goes in Years of, of a really active community and groups doing things like bike mom having loads of events and making it as encouraging as possible. Yeah, so we have a great community for that, but then we've got this maybe 60 to 70 percent of people who are interested but concerned. And we talked a little bit about the barriers, but one of the biggest ones that I hear every day is yeah, but I don't really, I don't really like the idea of me biking next to cars on a street. Yeah, I get it. They're really fast and they're really big and they definitely, at 20 miles an hour, you have a 50-50 chance of surviving a crash. I get it, totally. Um, <laughs> these are real numbers that you can't, you can't just turn down. The biggest thing though, and what a lot of people who do start by, by commuting, is you find out that there are some ways to position yourself, make yourself really visible. Visible and predictability is actually our key factors in making a really comfortable bike ride. So we talk a lot about routes, and you saw some of those red lines on there. That is half the battle. 
Half the battle is finding bike-friendly routes that you really want to bike on that are comfortable and easy for you so you have time to decompress after your day or before your day you have time to think about uh, what you want to do, these things that we're thinking about errands before and after work. You want to find a good route for that, and then the second thing you want to do is that all the roads that you are on, you want to be very, very predictable. Now, we're going to go through a couple of these things, and you can find them, too, on the back of any bike map as well, um, which we, we brought some, to. too. But these things, you'll also, if you're ever interested and you want to challenge yourself, there is a there is a website called bikesafetyquiz.com. Oh, yeah, it's two slides later. Oh, it's two slides. <laughs> no problem. It's really fun. You can do it on your phone. It's really great. <laughs> But anyways, uh, there are some things that we don't think about naturally as far as being visible. Uh, you think, oh, but being on a sidewalk is a lot safer, right? But actually, a lot of car drivers are not expecting a fast-moving vehicle to sh pop up on a sidewalk. That you're very, it's very unlikely that you're actually going to be seen when you come up to an intersection and you're on a sidewalk. We really discourage that if you're over 12 years old. You probably shouldn't be riding on a sidewalk. You're probably going too fast to be very visible on a sidewalk, right? Um, your bike is bigger, you're a little bit faster, and you've got grown-up legs. <laughs> <laughs> Being in traffic with those big scary cars can be much more visible. You're out there in the lane. Now, do you think being in, dodging in between parked cars on the side of the road, do you think that's very visible? Absolutely not. But you think you're safer because you're actually getting closer to the side of the road, right? But actually, we find that car drivers are really not expecting you to pop out from the other side of that to the car, and you're having a really hard time also making sure that there are cars behind you. Now you can do some couple equipment things. There are plenty of people, experienced bikers in this community, that'll have a little mirror on the side. I do not have a mirror on the side. That would be the first thing I would lose when I went to the grocery store and I attached my helmet to the back of my backpack. It's gonna be gone in five seconds. So what you have to do is I have to make sure that my neck is able to turn and I can see and hear behind me, right? Well, the best thing to do is make sure that you're out in the lane. Cars can see you and I can see cars. So these are some of the things that a lot of people, you think you'd want to ride right next to that curb, don't. Now also dooring. Dooring doesn't happen very frequently or at least it's not very reported in this community, but we have, especially on campus, a lot of parking on the side of roads. Don't ride your bicycle. Your natural inclination is, again, to be out as far away out of the way as you can for a car. And we encourage that, too, as well. But we want you, really, to get away from parked cars. Uh, the doors will fl fly open. Very few people. It's just not within our culture that you can say uh, reliably that someone's going to check before they swing open their door. They don't. A lot of things. They really don't. And sometimes they're looking at their phone and kicking their door open too. You gotta watch out for this. So don't even try it. Don't don't worry about it. Just make sure that you're. If you have a lot of, uh, like for instance, right out here on Peabody, it's all parked up all along here. What you want to do is you want to make sure that you're in the middle of a very narrow road, and cars can pass you when it's safe to pass you, as if you're the size of a tractor, right? Like. Cars are just going to have to wait until it's safe for you to pass because you have to be taking further in the lane to make sure you're away from car doors on the side. Yeah. We do have bike lanes in town that are in the door zone. Um, mm -hmm. Some of those, through some advocacy, actually have lines to show these crosshatches in the bike lane. And yeah. Charlie Smythe, our council member, explained those to me. He said, we insisted they paint those because we're bikers and we know. Mm -hmm. That shows how far the door reaches into the bike lane. <laughs> and. Uh, because yeah, but bike lanes, you know, in door zones is actually a common mistake in building yeah. bike facilities. So that that last slide over there illustrates these doors in the bike lane. Just be aware of. Now, you also too, you never have to be in a bike lane. Um, just to make sure that you know that as a cyclist, you don't have to be. There's a lot of obstacles that can occur, like a car door. If you're too close, you can ride the line, or you can be, take the lane. Um, I frequently will always take the lane if I'm ever going to make a left turn. You always want to make sure that you're not making a left turn while a car is right next to you going straight. That's terrifying and also weird, and I might die. So, <laughs> yeah. so those simple things. Right. So um, this metal slide does show just like a car. Yep. Just act like a car. Um, get in the left turn lane to turn left. You do have an option of doing it like a pedestrian if you're more comfortable or if just traffic forced you to do it. You can go straight, and then you can realign and go left. But um, if traffic, there's a gap in traffic, you know, signal, take your lane. Feels a little weird when you do it. You know, you're small, you're out there with cars, but it works. 
And uh, it's kind of nice. You give yourself permission to act like a car. Cars generally let you do it. Do you and have then, any suggestions yeah. for, um, like, most yeah. of the time I have no problem behaving like a car, but sometimes you get harassed by, like, people in cars who, like, honk at you or yell at you and just think yeah. that you shouldn't be on the road. That's actually really funny. When you behave like a car, like when you, you know, are in the middle of the lane or whatever, and they want to get by you. So are there is there anything you can do? I mean... Well, don't slow down. Oh, yeah. <laughs> don't, like, don't, 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 don't get like me yeah. have some bout of road rage or yeah. something like that. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, well, I could go slower. Uh, don't do that. Uh, no, actually, really, um, I, I can't say there is very much you can do for ignorance about traffic laws. My sounds like it's getting a lot better. People are getting more educated. I know I'm part of a, a statewide version of Champaign County Bikes that goes into high schools and we talk to driver's ed classes. Um, and that's just one of my regular LCI uh, commitments. Yeah. Yeah, I think to uh, think about Jennifer's question. <laughs> yeah. I think part of, the, part of the challenge that bicyclists have is, is building up some mutual respect with drivers of automobiles. And so when bicyclists do have on uh, right clothing, when we are using our arms to signal, when we're clear about our intentions, when we behave as an automobile, so when we don't run stop signs, when we do all the things we're supposed to do uh, to follow the rules of the road, that builds respect in us. And I think the, the, the tension built has built because, you know, if cars don't, well, some people you can't do anything about. They'll be thinking you're in your way anyway. Yes. But if, if you're going through stop signs or stoplights that are red, that's where the tension starts to build. So we have to we have to build the, that uh, culture of mutual respect ourselves. Absolutely, but we also have to get the word out there too as well. Um, recent studies have shown that car drivers are much more likely to blow a stop sign or a red light than a cyclist. So and this is dependent on a lot of different things. And, you know, this community, we have a huge student body that is confused or perplexed on how to use sidewalks and roads and the differences. So we have a couple of those barriers. But I think that as far as aggression is concerned, it's happening a little bit less. If you ever feel unsafe, call 911 immediately. If someone's, like, following you and screaming at you and you feel threatened, absolutely. Um, make sure that... You can call 911 and have your phone on you, but that's that can also escalate and try not to re react whatsoever and complete and ignore the, the person. Most of the time, I think most aggressive and very angry drivers that you're you just exist and you're awful and you're taking the lane. But existence is work horrible. Um, most of the time, if you ignore them, you don't feed that that fire and they 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 get frustrated and drive off and go home and talk about it a lot. <laughs> so I just have to add a story to this because one day I was bicycling home a couple years ago and some of you have seen this bike that I ride to work which has got fat tires and a big diameter and all this and my bike's a huge <coughs> and there was this great big black pickup truck with big tires and tinted glass and was following me slow and kind of pull off to the side and I was actually getting nervous what was going on here and he rolls down his window and I'm getting ready for this confrontation and he's like and I'm just kind of hanging back to let him go. And he's like, and he's just like, like, and I come up there and I look up, I look up, and he's like, that is a cool life, man. I'm just tired of having I just want to like, I could totally have like, that. It's a total culture class. It was just the opposite of Yeah. Double take, sometimes I'll ride a folding bike or a cargo bike and be like, whoa. He's like, they just pulled up to scream at you. But that's awesome. Yeah, I got to just. I say, you know, I, it took me a long time to shake off my youthful behavior on a bicycle because it, to me, like, uh, part of the freedom and efficiency of a bike was like these sort of victimless traffic crimes that let me just do stuff on my bike that was, that I became aware. I definitely became aware. And, um, you know, it may be a hard battle because there'll always be another biker who doesn't obey the rules. But um, to me, I do have this like elaborate, awareness of uh, and sense of etiquette and courtesy with drivers and like to, to never steal the right of way from a driver to always you know yield appropriately and to act right in front of cars when in when in view of cars there's my asterisk <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> I will, if, if, if it's a deserted four-way stop sign, I will blow that stop. Uh, I'm not going to say I won't, but I won't do it. I won't do it flagrantly in front of folks because I'm very, very aware of what Steve said, which is when you do that, it just adds fuel to the fire unnecessarily. Um, uh, so. That you will find that uh, as a cyclist, I always remember those that one car driver, and I think it's all car drivers. And as yeah. a car driver, you always remember that one bicyclist, and it's all bicyclists. So yeah. uh, it goes both ways, very much so. Yeah, you can page through a couple slides here. I think <laughs> this is yeah, these Side signals. Um, a little detail. When I was a kid, they taught me you know, the right turn, the left <laughs> turn. But this is like really easy you to remember, still, <laughs> and it's really easy to interpret as well. You can you don't still have do, to do that, this. but this yeah. looks like you're waving hi to someone. Yeah, and, and my kids like always get that. And then I see this with the left hand, and yeah. it's like, it's, you know what? Point where you're gonna go. Before, Before they did that, I started doing like this this thing because I was like, no, I'm not. I'm, I'm gonna do something. I mean, how, how confusing would it be if you were in a car and you were trying to pull out of a parking lot and nobody would let you in because they thought that you, were, you didn't want to go anywhere? I do want to oh. say one thing. This is on the back of the map that we're going to hand out to you. So you can go through this in detail to your heart's content. But I want to flag this. A lot of drivers don't understand this. When you're a driver and you're turning right, are you allowed to go into the bike lane? Like, what's the deal? Who has the right of way in the bike lane? Yeah. So it's safe and appropriate for a car to merge right and go right into the bike lane if they're turning right. You don't have to somehow have this like awkward gap on your right when you're turning right, because that does invite this sort of conflict with potential traffic coming from behind you There's a big and passing you on your right. When you're on the bike, don't ever let that happen. Don't yeah. you know, be really aware about getting trapped inside a right turning vehicle. But um, a There's lot of cars, a large I think, co caveat though. Yeah. Don't ever change lanes within 100 feet of an intersection. That is against the law, and for very good reason. It's called cutting someone off. Um, <laughs> uh, and so this would also be something that we see as probably the most, the most innocent uh, misbehavior that a lot of car drivers, they feel like they're just getting out of your way, but they're really cutting you off in a way that they maybe are engaging your speed appropriately, or there was you know, something that they can't see that's in front of you, but you feel you're going to be boxed in, pinned in, and hopefully your brakes are working in a tip-top shape. So um, one thing that if we did have a, if you ever take a bike safety on bike, uh, bike safety course as an adult, they'll show you how to evacuate your bicycle or make a sharp right where you just twist the wheel and, and basically learn how to hop off in a very, very, very uh, uh, abrupt fashion. Because this is something that you have to know Someone might cut you off. So, very, there's caveats. Yeah. 100 feet of an intersection. Okay, so you can go ahead and advance again. <laughs> this is that bike safety quiz. Um, then we're taking this. It's super good. Okay, so this is like a DMV driver's test. It's very detailed, it's very informative. You will it's be surprised about the law around what you can and can't do as a biker and super all funny. the details like, what do you do on a sidewalk? All that stuff is there. Um, and it's a, this is a great tool because, as you can see, they have stuff targeted. And in Kilmeade, Illinois students get this now, too, as well, which is good. Yes. I wanted to ask a question about um, at approaching intersections. Yeah. What do you do when it's like, you know, the left at 5 o'clock and you're going into, you say, Urbana, and there's yes. four-way stop signs, and everybody is bound and determined to get in front of you to get to that stop sign. Oh, I know. And you end up behind the line of cars. <laughs> Like, <laughs> you you stay be in that line of cars, honestly. Um, uh, like worst case scenario, if you are really far behind in this, if there's no one on the sidewalk, you can hop the sidewalk because in the city, uh, unless you're in downtown Urbana, downtown Champaign or Green Street, you can ride on the sidewalk. Don't do that if there's someone walking your dog ever. Um, <laughs> and that's only if you get really caught in doing that. What they're doing is, yes, they're passing within 100 100 feet and they're trying to get into that that rush to go to nowhere as we as you know as a cyclist you're like well where are you really going for a red light yeah. um, there, there are well, some streets do it too though yeah i mean they pile Absolutely. up at the, at the front of the yeah they they go around you on so your right. we don't uh, a lot of car drivers and a lot of cyclists are confused about how many people can fit in one lane <laughs> that, that's tough. That's very tough because you just think, well, I'm a lot smaller. I mean, um, in many times before there were ever bike lanes on the streets, 
you know, it was kind of just common theory that you go on to the side and a lot of car drivers were like, well, they're out of my way, whatever. <laughs> um, these days with a lot of bike lanes, you don't have to do that and you shouldn't really split that lane. Uh, once you do do that, especially if you're sending that signal to car drivers, just imagine what kind of chaos that is. And you can see that in some car cultures, like you see the south side of Chicago, I see it all the time, cars trying to split one lane. It's dreadful, it looks like someone's trying to play bumper cars with each other. Um, so stick behind the car and wait your turn to go up. More than likely, uh, most stop signs, this town does not have really, really terrible traffic most of the time. And most of the time that's the problem with these stop signs and red lights is that people have an inappropriate idea of how long they're gonna have to wait behind that stop sign. Like maybe you had 10 seconds. So are we really in a rush? Are we really gonna make bad choices for that extra 10 seconds? Probably shouldn't, especially on the way home. I think it probably happens more like at Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and that's a side path on the side. Yeah. 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 Because you're gonna get stuck. Everybody's gonna get stuck. Everybody right. there's a left lane and a straight lane, and there's not really much of a shoulder. And the, it's the lights too short. Yeah. It is too short. And also, I mean, I wish that just maybe you know, 15% of those cars could be a bicycle because we would all go yeah. at the same time. Um, but there is a, a eight foot wide sidewalk on the side of that too as well. <laughs> at Pennsylvania and Lincoln? Well, no, other places. Like oh, on Florida. Oh, that's awful. <laughs> Wait, where, I'm, where, where are you talking about? On the side of the president's house. Yeah. The president's house all has lights. There's some places there. Yeah. Oh, orchard. Yeah. You're thinking about it. There's orchards of light. Florida. So that's a half block. I mean, so, like I said, sometimes. if someone does do that to you, you shouldn't slow you down much. It really shouldn't. Just, just the wait. Intersection of Pennsylvania, just wait. Lincoln, if I'm on Pennsylvania, you know, at the stoplight, I, I get in the right in the middle of the yeah. you know, go through line. So, but you can't, they can't. I purposely don't allow to get myself in a situation where I'm next to a car. Well, I'm assuming you're doing that too as well. Because I thought what you're saying is that you're going, the car driver is hopping into oncoming traffic yeah. to get around you, like yeah. in a very dangerous fashion. And like I said, just wait in those cases. It's not gonna, it's not worth your time and your safety to get pinned against that car on the right side. Um, if that car driver was like, I'm not gonna use my turn signal today and I'm gonna make a right turn in front of you, and you didn't know that, you're gonna be pinned. And we don't want that, so just wait. It's a very un dangerous behavior that it, if that happens to you, it's not worth fighting. It's not worth playing a leapfrog kind of game. Yeah. Yeah. Like if one Good car question. Does it, then the next car doesn't. Then the next car doesn't. The next, and next, and next, and next. Yeah. Man, if it piles up at Florida and Orchard like six cars back. Yeah. Our that's rush, our rush minute can be worth it. <laughs> <laughs> no, it really is. It's true. It's one of those things where I'm just like, how come we bike the next Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, one thing, yeah, uh, what I was assuming, and I think that's such a solid point, I shouldn't assume this, is take the lane and make sure that you're not encouraging someone to make that, like, that bad decision, you know, that we've all through. It makes me more comfortable when you take the lane. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because then you, you know you're not where you stand in the lane and where they stand in the lane. Right. Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> um, predictability. Yeah. Does anyone have kids? That they're biking with yes um just to go I, I just want to say one thing quickly about kids advance please okay. so the this is like the the balanced bike revolution so when i was a kid like you got training wheels and five or six year olds learned how to ride big heavy bikes with training wheels um and something happened in the last 10 or 15 years where people realize three-year-olds can ride bikes this is a cheap they have like really nice like scandinavian wooden bikes and things you can but I'll tell you the balance bike stage, which is a bike without pedals that a child can straddle and flat foot over the seat. Um, that stage lasts three, <coughs> three to four weeks, and then they will balance on two wheels. And if they have pedaled a tricycle, adding the pedals in. Um, so both of my boys learned how to ride to two wheeler when they were three um, and have been riding since. Um, but this is an example. So we did not spend, we did not buy the Scandinavian wooden bike. We bought a cheap little bike and took the pedals off of it, and okay. that was the three week balance bike stage. And we put the pedals back on. Communities like this too, you can frequently call up Steve and say, "Hey, are you down with that bike?" <laughs> yeah. And then your friend's gonna call you up in a couple of weeks. 
Right. <laughs> um, All right, so you can advance a couple more. Oh yeah, this is a face mask is really good tool. No, I'm kidding. This is, a, <coughs> this is just one of, my, of July. one of my goofy kids. And um, yeah, I got a little indulgent with the photos. Go ahead, one more. Um, on his way to school. So sidewalk, <coughs> sidewalk riding is okay for kids. Totally is. Okay. Absolutely. So um, don't do it as an adult. Yeah, this is essential uh, bike commute equipment, and it's it's very very simple. These are Lily. Do you agree? These are the minimal four. Absolutely. Four to five. Uh, uh, lights are the law, bike. and helmet is not the law. Just so you know, um, helmet is not the law for motorcycles either. Highly encourage them for both sports. You know, it's both commuting and transportation aspects. The concrete is so stiff, even though you're so strong, it's like really hard. Yeah. Um, I've learned that the hard way many, many a time. Uh, lights are the law, and you have to have a rear light and a front light. Uh, it's actually a rear reflector, and if you do, we're, we're in the midst right now of Illinois trying to change this law. Uh, you do have to have a rear reflector at all times, so if you have a rear light, you still have to have that. I don't think you're going to get pulled over for a ticket on that one at all. Um, what I would say is get a rear light over a rear reflector. Uh, Hands down. Yeah, every biker it's knows so that what you're worried about is what's coming from behind you. That's, so where, that's where you want to be visible. So everybody's like, yeah, we'll go with the right. We'll go with the light. More you look like a roving disco ball, the better. Yeah. You know, exactly. people are like, whoa, what a dance party this bicyclist is doing. That's because they saw you. See, yeah. it's awesome. So um, protecting your head is very important. I can't emphasize that enough. The traffic is very slow around campus, and that's great for safety. But it, especially when you're going out on long rides, and you, at, I personally feel like comments are really, really good. Yeah. Um, that protection. So if you have a really great lock, but you don't know how to use it, like it's not going to do you any good. And how many times have you been around campus and you saw just one wheel locked up to a bike rack? Uh, we just picked up a abandoned bike at Roger Adams Lab this morning. It had was missing a front wheel. Oh. So the person just abandoned it there. You have to lock up both your wheels and the frame to the bike rack. And there's a, a myriad of ways of doing it. And I think the cheapest and easiest way is you get a cable to go right through there if you have quick release wheels. And those are the wheels that have a lever that makes it really easy for you to pop your wheel off or take it flat or putting it in your car. Um, if you have bull ponds, the idea that theft, it takes a little bit more time for someone to steal your wheel. So it's a little bit more theft resistant. It's certainly not perfect. A cable, you can wrap it around and slide it on your U-lock and lock that to a, a U-loop rack. And your set bike is pretty set. Up. Yeah. I want to say one thing about the bike itself. So does everyone in the room have a bicycle? Okay, yes. Um, then fine, you're basically set. But one, one interesting, just about any bike can work for a uh, bike commuting bike. But it's true that um, like what are called like department store bikes, um, can break quickly and can be kind of inefficient. So I, I do think that there is a, at least for a new bike, there is a price threshold of what constitutes a quality bike that is worth investing in. So, I mean, I got my first real quality road bike 15 years ago, it was $800. I still have it. Its annual cost of ownership is like 60 bucks. And it is great. I mean, it is, as fast as anything, and you know, you go out, if you do go out on the group ride and see all the elite bikers, a lot of them are riding on bikes that are used bikes because they've had them for years and they work fine. So a quality bike is worth seeking out and acquiring, whether you buy it used for a couple hundred bucks or new for whatever that entry threshold is going to be, um, you know, whatever your budget you decide, but um, quality matters for your enjoyment and for efficiency, I think. And if you ever have questions about that, the Campus Bike Center right behind this building is a really good resource. A lot of the students who work there are bike aficionados. They love talking to you about what to look for and when you're trying to find a good, good quality bike, too, as well. And we we do currently have about 16 to 12 bikes right now that are refurbished. The refurbished ones, I can't say it enough, are so much better quality and reliability than you would get a brand new department store bike. So uh, we just recently collected 700 abandoned bikes on campus last year and we donated them to Malawi and they loved them, but they wouldn't take our department store full suspension mountain bikes. So <laughs> like says a lot, they're, they're just, if they break, they're, they're done, they're disposable. So. And uh, as the designated normal, just a normal guy bike rider, I got to say another barrier to biking is a perception that 
hey, if you don't have the right gear, you don't have the right bike, you know, um, you're not going to be accepted or you can't do it or this or that. And just got to pop that bubble if that's a barrier or a bubble for you at all. Um, there's all kinds of bikes and all kinds of aesthetic yeah. conditions out there that work. This that took work me years well. to get a good rain jacket. Wow. Yeah. But I mean, like any sport, um, there's some people who are real gadget and gear centric and they have disposable income and they love to have this. Fine, that's great. But you do not need those things, nor do you need to be able to rattle off a catalog's worth of brand name knowledge and everything to be a biker. That is, don't let those things be barriers to being a biker. Yeah, and I think in, the, in this town, it's so accepted that there's a lot of people who love, if you have questions, you know, there's a lot of people who love to answer them for you. But then also, too, I don't think very many of us in a college town are going to be quick to judge anybody for not being out there biking. We're really happy, though, that there's someone out there biking with us. Exactly. So. Okay. Other than the clock, I think we got we to gotta push that, forward. So, yeah. Um, this is like that second level of essentials. So having a pump is really important. And uh, being able to lube your chain is also convenient. Um, uh, they're not the absolute bare minimum because you can get those things for free from bike shops. Um, but uh, having them in your garage is good. Premium tires is the other real thing that is the smartest investment I've ever made. So about every couple of years, I'll buy like, I'll invest like 80 bucks or hundred bucks in some really nice puncture proof tires. And I will not have a flat tire for two years. I'm currently two and a half years into my, my tires. And so that confidence of just like, I'm not going to get a flat. I think having a flat tire. It up. Yeah. Yes. Oh no, yeah, you do it. That's why you have the pump. So the other thing people don't realize is your number one cause of flats is like letting your tires get soft. So you do need to keep your tires nice and firm up to their maximum recommended pressure. But um, you know, the difference between a standard tire and a slightly more premium tire that has some Kevlar or some other puncture resistance. For convenience, I love having that convenience. I rarely, rarely, rarely have a flat. Yeah, and, and try to stay away for, like, it's hard sometimes seeing glass on the road, but if you do see it, avoid it. And that's when it's slow down, say, wait till it's safe to pass, signal, and change lanes. Um, but also avoid construction sits, too. It's always where you find the really great big staples that are in the road. Um, premium tires, I think, is almost universal for a lot of experience. It's just uh, making sure that your bicycle is as reliable as it can be when you're trying to go to work or go someplace. Um, spare tube is always very helpful, even if you don't know how to fix a flat. That way someone can help you, they'll pull over, a lot of cyclists will want to help you. Um, and if you have a tube that fits your wheel size, it goes a long way in making sure that you're, you can be helped for, in that situation. Okay. Yeah, so um, having a bike trailer yeah, for the back of the car has unlocked some really great and very scenic um, um, bike rides out in the field, being able to uh, bring your bike and then bike from that point. Um, that's the car wreck, sorry. Bike trailer, um, I got it for my kids. I've kept it. Um, I got it for 75 bucks, an open box special at Target. It is cheap, but it's not broken yet and it's 10 years old. And it lets me go to Schnucks and get like six bags of groceries. So I really think that's fun and I feel like a huge nerd when I do it, but it's convenient. I can put a cooler in there and a blanket and go to Strawberry Jam and have be like a rolling picnic. It's, it's really fun to do that kind of thing. So I like the bike trailer. Um, and then there's fancier ways to carry gear on your bike. And if you like gadgets, devices, tools, you know, there's an endless rabbit hole to go down <laughs> with biking. I don't have any of that stuff. I don't have any special stuff. I will say that some people love stuff, and there's stuff. There's so much stuff. <laughs> there's so much stuff. Um, that I will say that uh, in many communities where it rains a lot, they would say there's never a bad day to ride your bike, which is the wrong year. Um, but having a rain jacket and a pair of rain pants is not a bad idea if you're biking in the snow or in the rain. You just you don't want to get wet. You just, you want to get home and you want to be dry. So I always like to carry this time of year, carry it. I carry a, a really lightweight, packable little rain jacket on days where I totally know that there's a good chance that I'm going to get rained on. I'll bring rain pants. I just don't want to get wet. You don't have to as a cyclist. You know? uh, I don't mind my hair gets wet, whatever. Oh my God. Oh, there's, my, there's my $75. So That's a friend. That's not my wife, Rachel. Um, but, uh, yeah, there's the, there's the rocking $75 bike trailer. Worship down? My, yeah, rocking oh. seat, my Birkenstocks. I have no high tech gear. <laughs> no, not even close to shoes. <laughs> Careful. Yeah.
you're on our way to Fourth of July. Um, so the next little section is like, where do you fight? So this is a cup. This looks crazy. This is the map we are going to hand out to you. This does lay out in some good detail where bike routes are, and it is a useful tool to refer to. It also has a ton of educational content. We've already uh, shown some of that to you. Go ahead and advance, Lily. Yeah, um, just one quick thing. Oh, oh, yeah. it does besides Google Maps, does it also gives you those red dots at intersections? If you're just trying to figure out your new route, is say you move to a new place or you've never biked to work, uh, these red dots are really good information just to avoid an uncomfortable situation or uncomfortable places to be at on your bicycle. Something that you can bike, but it's not recommended by anybody on that. Uh, who is helping put together these local routes. Very well thought out map for sure. Yeah. But here's the Google Maps. And if you had, didn't know this, because you may not have had occasion to use it, there is this bike icon at the top. So you can have it route you between two points and you can choose bicy bicycling as your mode of transportation. And it will route you on good biking routes and give you some options and tell you about how long you can expect it to take. So that's useful and it's obviously on your phone as well as on your desktop computer. Um, there's a 20 minute perimeter, you can, you can go ahead. Um, so what I wanted to say here was just in the last little bit is this was my gateway drug to uh, longer rides on the prairie. Um, so monthly on the full moon, there are rides that leave from Meadowbrook Park um, and go to Sydney Dairy Barn. And uh, they very accessible, it's very easy. It's a straightforward ride. It's not completely easy. You will feel like you get some exercise, especially if you're new to it, but it's 11 miles each way. And um, to me, this was the thing that sort of got me through the barrier of riding out of town and out onto the landscape. Um, so that's my then seven-year-old son. He can do it round trip. Um, uh, and we really enjoy it. So if you, uh, if you advance this, a few pictures of what that ride is like, once you're out of town, the roads are empty. I mean, it is very common not to see a car um, for like an hour in each direction. It takes about an hour to get there and an hour back. Um, the sun goes down, people are like, God, you're out there, you know, in the dark. Um, it's really easy. The moon comes up, um, depending on the month of the year, you get your fireflies. Um, you can see cars coming for miles. If you want to, you can like walk into the grass and give the car as much space as you want. And of course, you have lights with you too. Um, but it's, it's just deserted out there. It's an incredible experience. Um, okay, and then, yeah, I've got a few more uh, on those prairie rides. So this is ancient, this is here just to make you laugh because this is from like 1971. Although these roads are, are still pretty good, but go ahead and advance. It's not, obviously yeah, it's, it's 80s, it's 80s. Right here. It's gotta be 80s. That's so spread. 80s. This is like a really cool, still viable, but old school website with lots of street knowledge about longer prairie rides. Go ahead. They have links into all these different loops and you can go to them and then have the Google map instructions of, of that loop. Um, go ahead. Um, IDOT actually publishes county maps showing the bike rating of the entire grid of the county, county roads. Um, and so this is a link into that and I can share these links with you, go ahead. Um, and then a couple of phone apps that um, riders like to use, Strava or Ride With GPS are a couple of good ones. Um, everybody, this is, this is in the gadget thing, but these are free apps and it'll give you data about your bike ride. It's kind of fun. You need gadgets to talk to. Exactly. Um, so I think this might be it. Do I have Riding without here? GPS. Right. <laughs> exactly. Oh yeah, let's, let's, uh, we're in trouble now because I think the next set of slides is like every bike organization in town. Oh! And we don't have time to talk about them. Yes, let's just get them a visual. UIUC Campus Bike Center. Boom. Yeah. <laughs> this is a great group to volunteer with, and if you ever work with a group to, that needs volunteer hours, send it in that way. This is that group that I was talking about with, that does the bike safety quiz. Statewide org. Prairie Cycle Club is a local club that does rides like every day of the week in season. They're about to launch their ride season, and this website is really, really good. There are a really resources. fun one in town on May 20th called the CU Food Cruise. Yeah. Lots of food trucks involved. So mountain biking club based out of Kikuku. And uh, a couple of good bike shops here. Champagne Cycle has been around forever and is amazing. Neutral Cycle is close in, to campus and also great young kids. Here's Lily's website. It's getting better, I promise, eventually. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. I think you should just advance through these. It, it, basically, it's like every organization. The, yeah, it has a little piece of them. Uh, Brand new, start of opening this fall. There's going to be a trail. Yeah. Yay! Trails are awesome. They bring in huge tourist dollars. They're really, really fun. It's a yeah. one of the experience crowd. One of the things we do in Champaign County Bikes is interface with all these organizations on their bike stuff. We've, we've advocated for this bike plan and things like that. And that bike friendly community designation is, is one of the real pride points of what we've done. Um, MTD is a great partner. And that's it. Well, I'll be putting this into a like PDF form just so that we can have those local resources. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, we're and all these really cool pictures. That we're recording. Awesome. Oh, we're recording it. Never mind. That's good enough. <laughs> I know the bike shop in back here was looking for a different location. Is, is that still a plan or is that just. Yeah, it still is a plan. Actually, uh, um, whoever let us in the door here set, gave us a heads up, like a five year out heads up. For, and so I've been adding it. I work at facilities and services, and we have a planning division that works with buildings and and does a lot. So I've been kind of throwing it into little things here and there. But there's nothing. I mean, we're still just trying to beat the bushes. We're really looking uh, still for another location. Where, where are you want to find your uh, that five year like timeline? Oh, I think it's still in the the five year out timeline. To the best of my knowledge. But I, I guess this is, and I think there's probably people in this room who might know more about it, but I guess there's been a huge push to move many of the storage facilities south of campus back into university owned uh, storage facilities on campus. Well, I am working on something that requires us to abandon the whole building, uh, a very large facility near the physical plant. Yeah. And a couple of one of the main things we're going to try to do didn't work out, and we're actually looking to bring them back and reusing our our garage facility back here for the yeah. whole outfit. And so that's another reason I asked the question. Yeah. And and I'm just certainly uh, in a, in like a in a perfect world, I would have a wealthy alum one from Silicon Valley who would say like, here's $25 million for a velodrome in a campus bike center. Nice. Yeah. That hasn't happened yet. <laughs> but if you know anybody, send them my way, just saying. Um, but there are also, there's a lot of interesting talks going on right now. They just launched a new plan for the Alliance Union and there was, uh, it was merely just a planning exercise. There's something to have on paper for, for asking for donations and get, soliciting support and, and all sorts of different reasons why. And there's things like acro yoga and stuff involved in it. But there's also deep in the weeds of it, there's Campus Bike Center. Oh, nice. So there's all sorts of opportunities. Um, I Last night I was at the Campus Master Planning uh, input form and it was very, very interesting, but there are a lot of uh, opportunities for new spaces that they're looking at. And um, this would all, of course, be within uh, required the demolition of other spaces and and uh, some kind of weird funding mechanism that certainly if you know the history of the campus bike center it's there's never really been an appropriate concern for funding <laughs> so it's really just been like I need duct tape where do we get it okay <laughs> all right let's get some duct tape um, so uh, that's where we're at we're still you know we're still looking for sure. We're at the top of the hour. We're a little fast, oh, so yeah, yeah sorry. Let's, let's call it. Anyone, we'll, we'll stick around. So if anyone would say informal or see the cool gear that Lily brought, um, come on up. But if you have somewhere to be at one o'clock, you're five minutes late. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs>